Welcome ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia and we are here looking at an insect specimen to sketch. I was in the chat box over with Susan um, chatting about what we wanted to sketch today and she suggested a Lepidopteran. It's been a while since we've drawn any type of butterfly or moth. Um, admittedly, they're the ones that I also have the least practice with so it's always good to, to get them on the screen and to get some sketching in for these guys. Um, I looked over at what was sitting next to me, and I do have my entire drawer of tiger moths, or my entire unit tray of tiger moths sitting next to me. I pulled this one out because I find it absolutely gorgeous. Um, now, this tiger moth, I'm not exactly sure... I'm not sure the exact species on this moth. Although, I can get you to genus. Um, it's definitely in the genus Apentesis, um, but there are a couple of different species that have uh, varying spots um, or varying designs on their hind wings. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the character is that divides them. So, if I had to take a guess, I would say that this is the harnessed tiger moth, Apentesis phalarata, but I can definitely say for certain that it is in the genus Apentesis. Um... I'm not sure exactly what species. All right, so Susan was also chatting. Ooh, you found a book. A house with good bones. Oh, that's cool. Oh, I love uh, books that randomly go off on entomological tangents. Now, um, right now, I just feel... I was actually ch chatting with somebody at work today about this. I, um, I have been finding myself with not enough time to read because I have so many other things happening that I haven't had a lot of time to sit down and read. I am in the middle of Ant Hill that was sent to me months ago that I've been trying to finish and just haven't had time, but I will definitely put it on my list of books to read. Oh, that's so cool. Um, and then it's possible to see, um, there are a couple of different species that have this same kind of black and white striping on the front wings and the pink hind wings with a variety number, a varied number of spots on the hind wings. Um, this specimen was collected in Michigan in 2010 and it, from a quick glance of... Um, specimens that are common in Michigan on iNaturalist, there are four species that are all very similar. Now, if I would probably put it at Apentesis phalarata, this one. But so many of the species in Apentesis are so similar that I'm more comfortable saying it this way. Um, because I'm not an expert on these guys. So, uh, we are looking at a tiger moth. All tiger moths... Let me make sure that the taxonomy hasn't changed. Because I was trained that all tiger moths are in the family Arcteidae. But, there we go. Okay. It has changed since I went to school. I thought so. Alright, so let's go through a little bit of taxonomy while we're looking at it. Um... Tiger moths are 
are in the family Arebidae, but Arebidae covers a whole large slew of um, different underwing species, tussock moths, tiger moths, and a whole bunch of other like closely related moths. So saying the family Arebidae, what they did was they took a whole bunch of families and they smashed them together and gave them a new name because they were all so close, they were all very closely related to one another. Um, but scientists didn't know it until they did genetics. And so they took a whole bunch of de families that were all separate and kind of smashed them together and called it this family Arebidae. Um, then you have a subfamily and this is where the Arcteids come in. Uh, all subfamilies are end in I N A E, at least in the insect world. Um, and the subfamily Arcteani includes tiger moths and they say and allies. What they mean is just and other closely related um, moths. So not even a subfamily just covers the tiger moths. You have to take that next step down and go into the tribe. And this is where you specify tiger moths versus everybody else. Tribes end in I and I. So for our beautiful tiger moth over here to the right, if you if we didn't know its species and we said we definitely know it's a tiger moth, it's got kind of dull uh, front wings, either black and white or beige colored or yellow colored. Most of the tiger moths have kind of a a dull front wing and a bright hind wing, whether that be bright red or pink like this one. Um, some of them have bright blue, like metallic blue hind wings. Um, and they also have brightly colored abdomens. So generally, whatever color the hind wing is, the abdomen also has that coloration. In this specimen, it was red. Um, that has now faded down to like a light pink. But um, the hind wings were bright red and the abdomen was red. Um, so all tiger moths, um, if you know that it is a tiger moth, you, you know that it is in the tribe Arcteani. And then anything past that, you have to de dive further into the taxonomy and further into the identification. Now, this specimen here as we said, is Apentesis species, but because we don't have an exact species, we don't have a common name for this friend. So we're just going to call it a tiger moth. All right. This is what she looks like. Um, I am going to go ahead and switch over to this camera. Terry, you're in the way. There we go. Hi, Hashi. All right, so uh, I'm gonna go ahead and give us a uh, a wingspan on this on this tiger moth. I would say this tiger moth has a four centimeter wingspan. Um, it looks like four centimeters pretty much on the dot. And then if we wanted to give kind of the length of the abdomen or the length of the body from the front of the head to the back of the abdomen, it's about two centimeters. So, um, <laughs> when this, uh, when this moth closes its wings over its back, it is just, um, going to cover the abdomen. Because if its entire wingspan is four centimeters, that means one wing is approximately half of its body. Well, you know, a little bit under half of its body. 1.7 Anyway, 
All right, there you go. I'm going to go ahead and start getting my sketch up here. So write our name. We're going to just go Tiger Moth. And then... I should remember that. Appentesis. So that gives us our uh, that gives us our name. We can go ahead and get started. I'm gonna clean my paper just a little bit. Sometimes I get some shadowing on this paper. Um, I tried a different journal and I don't like this paper as much. And for those of you out there who are paper snobs, I get it. I get it. Sometimes it's just important to know that you where you're sketching um, isn't gonna do weird things. All right. So with moths, uh, moths are generally going to have fairly wide bodies, and they are nice and fluffy, nice and setos, absolutely covered in hairs. Um, I'm going to be sketching mine op with its wings open, so I'm just going to turn my paper now to give myself a little bit more room. And I want to start with the head. The head is underneath our microscope, so you can see that pretty clearly. It's um, fairly short. Let's see, I'm going to put that guy right around here. And I'm just going to be starting my sketch really light with uh, this little D-shaped head, flat on the bottom, rounded on the top. Um, this, this moth does have a fairly large thorax, so it comes out away from the head, kind of like this. Um, and a lot of times with these moths, I'm going to point it out, but I'm not sure what we could call them. Um, a lot of times they will have these clusters of hair. Um, there's one over here on the left and one over here on the right. And um, they stay going flat and the wings kind of tuck underneath them. And then when you open the moth's wings... Um, these will regularly stay. Um, I would guess that they are clusters that kind of help protect the flight muscles underneath. Um, but I'm not sure what the purpose of them are. I just know that they exist and they are regularly found on many species of moths. Many different types of moths. And sometimes when I'm pinning, I feel like every now and again, they do have the ability to kind of fall off. And I like them to stay because I think that they're cool. So the, uh, the thorax of butterflies and moths is generally fairly boxy. Um, the, this gives the ability for, if you were to like look at the cross section of a um, moth thorax, You've got some muscles in here that kind of cross over and this and then the body kind of pumps like this and then um, that's what kind of creates the flight movement and brings the wings up and down. Um, and so a lot of times butterflies uh, and moths are going to have very, very square or rectangular thorax um, just so that, that the muscles can attach better. Um, all right, so now we're going to add this abdomen here. The abdomen is nice and wide, way wider than the head, so you might just make sure that it comes out here. But it does start a little bit more narrow than the thorax, and I'm just going to kind of give it an outline. When we zoom in, and we're going to go ahead and count all of these segments and probably change some of the design in here but that gives you um that that gives you a basis to work off of now 
this specimen, the right side is pinned better than the left side. I'm probably going to sketch by the right side because when you're looking at a pinned specimen of any type of butterfly or moth, your the perfect pin job will leave the back side of the front wings a straight line all the way across. This left wing I pulled up just a little bit too far. I should have relaxed it down a little bit. So to give you an idea, if you have a butterfly or a moth with a long body, the uh, this is the line that I'm talking about. Um, on every specimen or every butterfly or moth that is pinned properly, there is going to be a 90 degree angle from the head um, from the body to the bottom side of the front pair of wings. Um, there isn't really as much of a rule on the hind pair of wings, except that you want them even. So you can choose to leave them tucked up underneath the front wing a little bit more, or you can choose to kind of pull them back a little bit so you can see all of the features. It's essentially pinner's choice at that point. If it was a bird, those would be the scapular feathers. Oh, cool. So scapula, like shoulder blades right? Isn't the scapula the name for our shoulder blades? So that is kind of like exactly in the right spot for those. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to kind of take maybe a little bit longer than the abdomen and slide it out, and that's going to be my wingspan. <laughs> Let's see. I was off by about a half a centimeter. <laughs> yeah. There we go. All right, so that's going to give me my wingspan here, at least for the front wing. The hind wing is a lot shorter. Um, but now that I have at least that mark going for me, I'm going to reach up here to the front of the front part of the box of this thorax, and it's going to angle up. And I'm just going to keep going. I'm gonna actually going to make it longer than it has to be. And then I'm going to take this line and make it vertical. So I'm just getting my basic shapes in here. Now that I've got some of this taken care of, I'm just going to round off this edge. And that is going to be the outline for my wing. Sometimes it's easier for me to make straight lines, especially when the lines here on the wings are fairly straight. Um, it's easier for me to get straight lines than it is to, um, to do all of the curves all at the same time. We can always add some curves in later. Does it go high enough? I believe that it does. Okay. All right. So now we want to look at the middle of the thorax. The middle of the thorax is right around here, and it is going to go out completely straight. And look at that. I went over just a little bit, but that's okay. That's what erasers are for. And then we're going to round this off here. My question is, is that long enough? All right, I'm changing the shape of my wing just a little bit so that the front point is a little bit um, longer than the middle here. It kind of angles back, and I think that that's going to get me a more realistic shape here. Yeah, that's much better. 
All right, so I've got my front wing, front wing taken care of. Now we're going to be looking down here at the hind wing. Um, I do want to, I'm going to be following this right here. So the wing kind of separates, the hind wing separates from the front wing about in the middle, um, right around here. And then it does connect to the bottom of the thorax, it moves down in this direction, and then we have this nice... convex arch there's a part of me that wants to angle this front wing a little bit taller copy this right wing pair over to the left side um i want to well we'll see what we have kind of time for but i really enjoy doing wing venation on one side and then colors on the other side and our tiger moth has such beautiful colors um our tiger moth has such beautiful colors on the front wing. It makes me want to sketch and focus more on the coloration and the design. All right. I think we got that all taken care of. So we've got some wings here. We have the big body. Now we're going to zoom in and check this out. a pronounced head. I'm going to be kind of shortening the head here. Um, I do want to add what we can see of the compound eyes, and that's not a whole lot, but um, here, let's see. I also want to, before I add the compound eyes, I'm going to make this little bit of a mountain here on the thorax. So the thorax isn't shaped completely flat along the top. It has this little bit of an arch, little bit of a mountain here, and that's going to be where the head is connected. And the eyes you can see kind of on either side of this mountain. So if we come up from this point and then down just a little bit, that's going to give us our little bitty compound eye. And I'm going to do that on both sides. Now, it's not, um, we can't see the entire compound eye from the top, but that just gives us uh, something to work off of. Uh, cross hatch inside there and then um, from here you have all of that beautiful orange fluff or all of that beautiful orange CD. now um, my specimen I'm just going to give it a series of short hairs here to 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 show that and then we have our um, our antenna 
Now, the antenna. This is uh, my step stool for my sketch, so it can be just a little bit closer to the camera. All right. The antenna are what we call bipectinate. All right, so they have bipectinate and tunny. This means that the, well, pectinate is the scientific term for kind of comb-like. Um, and so when you say bipectinate, you're saying that it looks like a comb on both sides. Bi meaning two. Um, a lot of times bipectinate antenna ha receive the common name feathery antenna because they pretty much just look like feathers. And all, and moths are well known for having bipectinate antenna. Um, there are other insects that have it too. I just can't think of any at the very moment. But I swear there are other insects that have bipectinate antenna. Um, let's see. So the antenna are actually, if you look at the, the stem of the antenna, or that centerpiece, it is actually very thick. And then all of the smaller segments of the antenna that are coming off, those are all fairly short and kind of rounded up. So um, my first goal is just to make sure that our antenna are approximately the correct length. So if you look at your the specimen and the length of your wings, the antenna are going to be about half of the length of your wings, um, if that helps you any. So I'm going to start mine, and I'm just going to give kind of that center piece of the antenna, kind of like this. And then from the top, you're going to make sure that's very narrow, comes to a point. And then afterwards, you're just going to make it get wider and wider until it hits the head here. So... All right, so we have antenna number one. I'm going to go ahead over here and add antenna number two really quick. Oops. I want to make sure that the base doesn't get narrower. I accidentally narrowed it down here at the base. All right. Now all we have to do is give it that bipectinate feel. So for every single segment of um, for every single segment of the antenna, it has another one of those pieces coming off. So um, we don't really have time to go through and count all of those. We just know that there is a whole lot. So every time you have one segment that come one piece that comes off this side, it needs to also have a matching piece coming off of the other side. And then there's a segment in the center of the antenna. So if you go through your antenna and add one segment on either side and then add, a, add um, one piece on either side and then add a segment to the center, that's going to give you your most kind of realistic sketch of these antenna. Just make sure that they stay nice and short. And it's been a long time since I've done one of these type of antennas. So... Um, hopefully it turns out pretty. Looks like I might need to double up. So that at least gives us some some of these bipectinate antenna. They are not my best, but they are a work in progress. And I'm going to go ahead and give this to the other side too. And what I think I'm going to do differently on this side is I'm just going to make them 
significantly closer to one another You know, uh, and then we would give them um, all of the individual segments throughout the center. Their feathery antenna. Um, I think I want them just a little bit more narrow. I got this one just a little bit wide, I think. That's better. All right. Let's uh let's move our uh let's move our focus. I really think that those are there to protect flight muscles. All right, so we've got a series of CT from the front of the thorax that flails out like this, kind of fans out, and then you have these two kind of clusters of CD that are um, part of the flight muscle region. Uh, the rest of the thorax became kind of bare, and I think that that's just due to the uh, due to how old this specimen is. All right, so we've got a thorax. Let's scooch to see the, what the abdomen looks like. All right, Hashi is curious where and when I collected it. This specimen was collected in, aw. Um, this specimen was collected in 2010, um, May, May 30th, May 30th of 2010, um, in my hometown, by my mother. Aww. Um, my hometown. It was collected in, in, uh, New Boston, Michigan. That's awesome. All right, so um, we're looking at some abdominal segments, and admittedly, they're a little bit difficult for me to count. I'm having a hard time counting all of these individual segments on the abdomen um, because I think that there's so much CD up there at the front that there's probably a segment that I'm not seeing. But um, I would say one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five. I would say probably six abdominal segments, but the first one is kind of covered in that really beautiful golden hair. So I'm going to go ahead and give it some kind of... We're going to throw some more hair in here. of that golden hair and then I'm going to add some segments so the first segment kind of comes out right around here and it's mostly covered by this golden hair but you can see some of the segment reaching out from underneath it um, then you have 
So that's right around here. Then you have this second segment. And then three, four, five, six. Three, four, and five are all very thin, and they're the segments that kind of make the uh, abdomen narrow or get smaller. So three, four, five. And then that sixth segment is that one at the very, very end that really comes down to a point and then kind of rounds off at the end. I think my moth got a little too narrow. I'm going to widen it out just a little bit. There we go. All right, so that gives us an abdomen, but the we do have that very dark stripe down the center, and that dark stripe, um, it doesn't get defined or it doesn't change based on the segmentation here. So I'm just going to give really dark, and then once it gets to the very end, it does kind of end with this point. And I believe that the hair on the end of the abdomen kind of ends in a little tuft. Yeah, and that, um, and that dark stripe along our abdomen actually ends in kind of like a little hair tuft at the end of the abdomen, along with those lighter hairs. <coughs> All right, so that is what my abdomen looks like so far. Um, there's a part of me that needs to fix this right here because I think that I went just a little off of asymmetry. And so I can fix that a little bit. All right, that's better. So we've got a body. And I think that it's actually decent. So now all we have to do is worry about our wings. Can we see the thorax again? Yes, of course we can. I know I didn't add a whole lot of detail to my thoracic region. Um, uh, this specimen does have that kind of bare spot on the center of the thorax that makes it a little bit shiny. And that's going to be not true to a living specimen. Um, that uh, is actually from that, that kind of shiny space on the thorax is due to the moth rubbing uh, its scales off. So naturally it would have been covered. Here. This specimen does not have great wings, but it does have a good thorax. And you know what? I believe these are the same species. They were collected on the same night. Oh, more zoomed out. You are trying to get it all connected out. Okay, I can do that. 
but um, I kind of wanted to show you what its thorax is supposed to look like um, because this is our this is what the thorax is really supposed to look like it's supposed to have these three stripes down the center and it occurred to me that I had a specimen that actually was complete so there so that's what our thorax is gonna look like um, if it had all of its hairs and so when you look at the specimen that we are sketching You can see that the dark left stripe and the dark right stripe are these pieces here, or kind of like those shoulder hairs. And then you have, there's supposed to be a two white stripes here, and then another kind of darker stripe through the center of the thorax. And funny enough, that is going to align with your dark stripe here on the, um, on the abdomen. So, Susan, I hope that this is helpful. Let me know when you're done and so that I can scooch over. Um, funny enough, this specimen was collected in 2010, back when I was just starting to learn how to really pin and um, organize a collection. And so I used a pin that was just a little bit too large when I was spreading these wings. And so I made, I poked these really big holes in the wings from spreading it. Um, nowadays, I know to use the thinnest pin possible so that the hole is not visible or to use um, pinning forceps. Either of those methods won't put a giant hole through your wing. But back in the day, that's how I did it. And I'm thinking, we're not going to worry about the uh, wing venation on these friends. We're just going to draw, we're just going to draw the designs or the colorations on them. Yep, I think that that's best. All right, so now that we're kind of zoomed in on this front wing, there are some some things that we can see. Even though the bottom of the we want the bottom of the wing to be straight, now we're going to notice that the that it's not going to be all the way straight to the very end. It does kind of arch up a little bit. So let's see. I'm going to take This angle. All right, so I'm going to start darkening some of these lines. This all the way up to this arch I'm pretty happy with. So coming all the way up, just making sure that this line actually stays fairly straight. Okay. Um, the front of the wing up here is a little bit kind of further out than the bottom here. So um, when you're coming down, instead of making this just a straight line, we're going to angle it in a little bit. And then we're going to round this off. And coming back towards the body, we're going to try and keep that as 90 degree from the body as possible. But then, once we get closer in, we're going to arch it up. And erase all the sketchy lines that don't matter anymore. Alright, we're getting somewhere. So for me, I think what I want to do is kind of outline the darker regions. Um, 
and I'll just drop some graphite just like we did for these stripes in the darker regions. Now um, notice that around the edges of the wings it is mostly white so it has all of these kind of white scales um, that reach off of the edge of the wing. If you're on black paper, you can always use a white pen. Um, but if not, um, I'm just going to be leaving it this way. It's what I got. All right. So, um, I'm trying to imagine where our first, I'm not happy with that yet. That's better-ish. Let's see. I'm almost thinking it's going to be easiest to work from the outside of the wing in um, and base our first line off of this first white angle here. So we've got this white band that hits up at the top of the wing. Um, and then what I'm seeing is that this center stripe goes all the way up to this point here. So let's see. We've got, we'll double it up and come towards the body. And then once we come up towards the wing, it doesn't go completely straight. It does kind of angle forward just a little bit. So we've got this shape. You drew very faint pencil lines for the white lines. I like that. I will probably also be adding faint lines um, for those uh, for those uh, seedy at the edge of the wing. All right, so we've got that taken care of. Now I do want to go ahead and add the bottom of this guy here, and it's that one is not all the way straight. It comes out a little bit, and then there's a little bit of a an arch here and that maybe less of an arch okay and that is gonna create a triangle with almost the base of the wing so um, go right above where your um, right above where your ring, wing really starts to angle away and then um, that is going to come up and make a triangle. But it makes a triangle with the white border. myself just a little bit of space here to show that little white border. So now we've got our triangle here. We do have another triangle, well another two, right? So there's this little itty bitty one. He's kind of cute. And then the other one actually sits kind of in between these two triangles. So we've got this cute little this cute little dark triangle here, but then in between Ooh, I don't know about this. Let's see. Maybe what I have to do is start from the top and work my way down. I might have to make the wing a little bit wider. We'll have to see what happens. All right. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to come back up here and I'm going to give myself this little dark band here. All right, that one went well. And now we know how wide this band should be. 
where this triangle on top should start. And I think that the triangle on top is going to be important to do first. And the, this side of the triangle kind of matches this line here. And then we have triangle. Yeah. And then our little itty bitty triangle. I'm just going to make this wing just a little bit like that. Okay. That gives us enough space to add our little triangle friend here. Okay, and then our final shape down here, it's going to always leave that white line in between the two dark shapes, but it kind of arches up and then down. is not bad. All right, so I'm going to come in and I'm just going to give some darker graphite to the, I'm going to put, drop some graphite into these darker regions of the wing and then I'm going to smudge them in. I might even come back through with an eraser to keep the whites white. It's this little itty bitty triangle that's giving me problems down here, but we will fix it. That's not bad. All right, so we've got a front wing taken care of. Yay. Okay. This is as zoomed out as we can get on the hind wing. Um, if we want to, we can scooch it up just a little bit so you can kind of see where the, uh, the hind wing kind of compares in length to the front wing. For instance, like in my sketch, I'm going to be shortening up my hind wing just a little bit. It's just too big. So instead of it coming all the way out here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to follow this angle in. And that's going to be as long as I'm going to want my wing. I don't want it any longer than that. So anything that's past that, I'm going to erase. And then what I'm going to do is kind of uh, round out those edges just a little bit shorter. But I do want to make sure that, let's see, I do want to make sure that they, come on, friend. Here we go. All right. <laughs> Maybe I do want it just a little bit longer. I don't want it to look like a sphinx moth. I'm going to start from the bottom and work my way out. So we want the, uh, the bottom of the wing to kind of come down and arch out. And it's not going to be any longer than, um, 
it's not going to be any longer than the abdomen. It's going to sit kind of at that last abdominal segment here. And then we're going to kind of arch it out. There's something happening that's not so right. Make the outer edge of the hind wing go horizontal. Make the outer edge of the hind wing horizontal. I'm going to pull the specimen. So the trailing edge of the wing is much shorter than the leading edge. Right. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so I was, I think what I was doing was making these lines equidistant, but they are not. Um, this line has to be much shorter than this line, so, um, uh, right, trying to make it, the wing look longer. But it still comes down to about right around here in the, on the body. I think we're getting there. with that. It's not perfect, but I think that will work. And the outer edge curves so it is perpendicular to the body.
right, I think that that's the closest we've been all night. I think I'm going to leave it here. So the front, the leading edge of the hind wing has this really beautiful dark banding on it. Let me go ahead and just darken this line. That's how we're going to leave it. Um, the leading edge of the hind wing has this nice dark line and it comes down to a point. I am just going to leave a little bit of this white space here for all of those beautiful white CD that are hanging out. Um, and then we have another segment that kind of comes down like this that's nice and dark. Now the locations of the the locations and number of the um, spotting on the hind wing is how we're going to identify this species. So um, and even though it varies by individual, the um, overall kind of number of spots, the darkness of the spots, and the um, the locations are going to help you identify them. Um, all right, let's see. This piece almost looks heart-shaped, too. Now, these spots um, don't have to be exactly the right shape, as long as you get them in the ballpark. Um, because I don't believe that even if you look at the left and the right side, that they are the same. Um, so I'll show you that. We'll go and look at the left side really quick. So on this spot, on this, on the left side, you can see that it still has... Um, it still has those same kind of four spots. They're still in the same approximate location. But notice that that second spot down does not look like a heart. All right. So the spots are in a, the approximate same location, but the shapes of the spots are not exactly the same. Um, but the number of spots is. And so that's what really kind of matters. Um, it is really easy to see the uh, wing venation over here on the hind wing, and there's part of me that kind of wants to add it, just because just those spots don't feel like enough to me. So here we go. Um, there's only one more vein that you can't see very well. There is a cross vein around here that comes down and finishes this cell. Um, so when we sketch it, I'll show you that. Here we go. There's going to be one vein that kind of, it is up here in the darkness, but it kind of is up, up here. Then we have this main vein that comes down and it has, it shoots one off up here that goes through that dark spot here. All right. Um, now we're going to come down just a little bit further and the end... We're going to come down this is where that's that top one this is where the first one broke off comes down okay and then we have one that comes off of the bottom here and goes through the third spot. Yeah. In this region. This guy ends up coming up and dividing into halves and splitting into two. And then the cross vein that's going to create this cell uh, comes out from also around where this one comes down. And it's going to be coming out, down, and then coming back around this vein here. So that's that cell. 
and then you have two veins that come off from the center of the cell and one vein that comes off from the bottom of the cell. gives you a little bit, a little bit of wing venation. All right, so I am, I am happy. We did it. We got there. Very good. <coughs> Tiger moths, um, moths, butterflies and moths in general are a little bit trickier for me, but I appreciate the challenge from my friends here. I appreciate the challenge. Uh, it gives me definitely something to look forward to, um, to work towards, and I definitely think that they're improving. So that's all that matters. And we can talk about, um, we can we have been able to talk about them a little bit while we sketch them, which is awesome. Um, the only thing we didn't really look at while we were sketching is we didn't get a, uh, a head-on view. So, might as well turn the specimen and look at it just a little bit. Because, I mean, look how adorable. tell you any really cool facts about tiger moths. Um, man, I wish I had some good ones right off the bat. don't have any great ones. Not about tiger moths. I wish I knew more about them. The, uh, I do know that many tiger moths, um, that many tiger moths as caterpillars are the really, really fluffy caterpillars. So if you think of like a woolly bear caterpillar, a woolly bear caterpillar turns into, well, it is a tiger moth caterpillar. Um, I believe it is the Isabella tiger moth. Yeah. Uh, the one that we sketched today was probably the most common, is probably the most common tiger moth that I see fairly regularly. And not even just in Michigan, all over the country I see like um, moths in this, tiger moths in this genus. But I do have This lady right here is an Isabella tiger moth, um, and you'll notice that she, there's a couple of similarities between this one and the one we sketched. It still has that kind of black band down the center of the abdomen. She still has kind of a pink color on the abdomen, although it's a little difficult to see it as this specimen is a little bit faded. Um, but that's an Isabella tiger moth. So all tiger moths are going to have very, are kind, kind of going to have similar features. Here's another tiger moth. Um, this one is, I believe it's the species of cactus tiger moth. Give me a moment to look it up really quick. This one was collected in Arizona. And 
and it's fairly common. I believe it's the Choya tiger moth, but I'm going to have confirmation really quick. <laughs> oh, that one's cool. I love looking at these guys, too, because there are so many beautiful ones out there. I thought I had identified this one. Maybe not. Give me two seconds. I'm falling into a... I'm falling into a hole! I really want to identify this guy now. And I think that I'm so close to getting him... ID'd. Alright, I know how I'm going to do it. Give me two seconds. Sorry, guys. What are you, my friend? I believe I posted it to iNaturalist, so I'm going to really quick go through my iNaturalist IDs, and if he's not here, then I will give up. It's called a purslane moth, and as it turns out, is not a tiger moth. It was just in my tiger moth drawer. Silly moth tricked me. It's an octuid. That's why I couldn't find it as a tiger moth, though. Woolly bears are caterpillars of tiger moths. Yes, they are. Um, no flesh-eating fungi? No, unfortunately, there aren't any flesh-eating fungi associated. I can't think of any. Um, the caterpillar that has a mutualistic relationship with ants is a lysenid, not a tiger moth. Oh, sorry. The one that we the one that we sketched is in a panty uh uh blah blah blah. Let me uh, write that down for you. It doesn't have a common name. <laughs> um the genus is a pantesis. Uh I believe the one that we sketched So I haven't confirmed this identification because there are um, a whole bunch of apantesis moths that live in Michigan, um, and they all have the same kind of zebra striping on the front wing and then the bright red. Um, some of them are, have yellow on the hind wing. So some of them are easy to say, all right, it's definitely not that one. 
But because there are so many, and I can't guarantee that iNaturalist has them all, I'm not super comfortable identifying this guy just based on pictures. Um, the most common one, the most commonly seen, is called the harnessed tiger moth, and it's Apantesis phalarata, which is likely what it is. Uh, it's likely this species here. Uh, the common name for that would, would be the harnessed tiger moth. And that's the one we sketched today. But I just wrote tiger moth and apantesis um, just because that's what we are absolutely sure of. Um, if I go any further, I would probably only be like, nah, 75% sure. Maybe someone does need to do more study of tiger moths. <laughs> yeah, and admittedly, butterflies and moths aren't the aren't the insects that I've done a whole lot of research on. So I'm sure that there are cool things about tiger moths out there. I'm sure of it. I'm just not sure of what exactly they are. I could look in my book to see if I wrote down any back from back when I was studying them. Maybe there's a secret hidden cool fact that I don't remember that I wrote down for myself a long time ago. Let's see. Looks like so many notes. Uh, the hind wing has a subcuticus rest right from the anterior in the middle of the blah, 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 blah. No. Um, all right, here's something fun. And I'm not sure why they got this name, but, um, they're Arcteus... They used to be in the family Arcteidae, um, but now they're in the subfamily Arcteini. Uh, they're in the subfamily Arcteini, and uh, the root is based in the word Arctos, which means bear. All right, so um, the woolly bear is a tiger moth, and the family name Arcteidae, or Ar the now the subfamily Arcteini, is named after bears, like fluffy, cute little teddy bears. And I think with the, the head here being so fluffy... Um, Hashi, you're welcome. I tried to I tried to give you some cool facts. Um, thank you for hanging out with us and sketching with us. We really enjoyed your time. We appreciate you. Um, Arctos means bear. Um, and that's why Arctic is the Arctic. Yes, exactly. Arctic means the land of bears, like polar bears. And the Antarctic means the place without bears. <laughs> <laughs> ah, land of no bears. I love it. <laughs> That's a Greek root, not a Latin root. Thank you very much. Um, it is a Greek root. Thank you, Susan. I get my Greek and Latin roots mixed up sometimes. All right, so I'm pretty happy with our time here today. Let me go over here to our closer. Ooh, I said I was going to fix that last week, and then I didn't. So, alas, 
We're still doing it. All right, this is my final sketch. I know that everyone likes to see it kind of big at the end. I know I didn't do the other wing, but hey, um, we uh, you can see how the wing shape changed and evolved over time, which is kind of cool. Excited we get to throw a little bit of Greek in with our Latin. Oh, true enough. That is that is pretty cool. And admittedly, it gets um. It's funny because we call the scientific names of insects, we call them their Latin names, even though so many of the Latin names have are actually based in Greek. And so it gets a little bit confusing. <laughs> All right, so right here, this is out school. Um, I teach students all the. I teach students of school age, so five to eight, nine to eleven, um, twelve and older. I have a uh, high school like college prep entomology classes. It's the college prep I would have loved to have taken when I was in high school. Um. This is my, this is a reminder just to subscribe, all of you out there who have been hanging out, hanging out with me and chatting over in the sidebar. I know you're already subscribed, so I'm talking to the people out there in the back who have been hanging out and listening but not chatting. You can subscribe, and then you can chat and ask me all of the questions. Um... I just checked my INAP postings because I knew I'd seen somebody in this family. The one you found was an Arge moth, Apantesis Arge. Cool! Yeah, so you did see somebody in the same genus. Um, that is very cool. And I'm glad that they were able to identify it for you. Maybe I'll throw this one in iNaturalist and see if anybody IDs it um, for me to species. That is where you can drop a couple of dollars. You can buy me a coffee, five dollars, um, whatever you can afford. Um, it's uh, super helpful. I appreciate all of you who do donate to me and to um, Insectopia as a whole. It's always super duper duper appreciated. Down here is my email address, Trisha at theinsectopia.com. Um, that is where you can go ahead and send me your sketches. Um, I love seeing them. All right. It just makes me so happy to be able to see sketches that were kind of inspired by the live stream. And I know that all of your sketches look different than mine. So it's cool to see the variety um, of sketching styles when we're all looking at the same thing. Uh, if you're looking for me on Facebook or on Instagram, I'm actually at Insectopia2015. That is the year that I established the name, and so it's the year that gets thrown on to the end of our tags if uh, Insectopia is already taken. Um, so I appreciate your time. I think that um, I'm going to go to bed. So, have a wonderful rest of your night. Um, let me know if you see any cool bugs over the course of the next week. I'm always interested. This spring is coming and the bugs are finally coming out and I'm all super duper excited for that. Have a wonderful rest of your week and stay buggy.